Okay, so uh, first of all, does anyone, were there any questions on the homework that anyone would like to ask about? Yeah. For the first one? Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, uh, I don't have them in front of me. Okay. Um, I kept on, like, getting the wrong answer, even though it was fairly simple. Like, it wasn't the same as it was on the answer key. Oh. Yeah. Did, was my answer key wrong? I the first so. one was wrong. That's a bad step. To, all right, well, let me go through it to make sure, but uh, that's, I'm, you know, those solutions are pretty new, so uh, there's gonna that's going to come up. So sorry about that. That's a pain for everybody, but uh, uh, let's see. If, okay, so the first one, I'm going to try to make a note. Okay, so what was the question on that one? Anyone have it in front of you? I think it was C to the power of negative three. So D over D. Mm -hmm. D to the negative three. D, D, Z of Z to the minus third. And it should be negative three Z to the minus four. Yeah, and the, and the um, uh, answer key said negative Z to the power of negative two. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was my mistake. Sorry about that. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Yes. Well, um, I do not have time to grade every problem. So what I am going to usually do is scan for completion and then pick out one or two problems to, to grade for correctness, you know, just sort of at random. So that's, I would like to grade everything for everything, but I, I just don't have time to do that. So, so it's statistical sampling. <laughs> um, any other questions on the homework? All right, so uh, we talked about, so last time, We talked about derivatives. And indefinite integrals. And so now I just have to say a few things about definite integrals. Um, so, uh, if you're taking the integral from A to B of f of x dx, A and B are boundaries of your um, independent variable, x in this case, and that's just equal to um, the integral of f of x dx evaluated at x equals b minus the integral of f of x dx evaluated at x equals a. Um, and the key here is that the um, the constants of the constant of integration is the same for each, and so since you're subtracting them, the the constants cancel out. And so those constants of integration never come up. You never have to, those never come up in an answer in a definite integral. So like for example, uh, if you're taking the integral from zero to two of 10x dx, um, 
that is 5x squared from 0 to 2. That's 5x squared evaluated x equals 2 minus 5x squared evaluated at x equals 0. Um, so that's uh, 20 minus 0, so 20. Um, any questions about that? You done definite integrals already? Yeah, okay. Oh, done with calculus. That was all. Um, I would take the AP test now while it's fresh. So that's calculus one and two. Um, and uh, calculus comes up in physics very naturally because um, so. How does it come up in physics? Mainly, there, you know, it comes up in a few ways. But uh, the ways that are going to come up over and over again are first um, in the relationship between velocity and position. Um, the velocity of an object as a function of time is the derivative with respect to time of the position. Um, and remember the other notation for that is that velocity is equal to p dot. And so then equivalently uh, the position is equal to the integral of the velocity with respect to time. Uh, and for rotational motion, there's a relationship between, uh, we're going to see over and over again. Um, there's this correspondence between um, rotational quantities and translational quantities. So just like the translational velocity, the one you're used to thinking of as velocity, is the time derivative of position. Uh, in rotational motion, there's a relationship between um, angular velocity that we'll write as the Greek letter omega and the angular po position that I'll write as theta. That relationship is exactly like the relationship above. The angular velocity as a function of time is equal to the time derivative of the angular position as a function of time. You can write that as theta dot. And using the fundamental theorem of calculus, that's the same thing as angular position is equal to the integral of the angular velocity. OK, so that's one. That's the first thing that's going to come up over and over again. And then the second thing that's going to come up over and over again is the relationship between velocity and acceleration. Um, we haven't defined these things yet. You've, you know, you've heard those words or whatever, but we'll define it all carefully mathematically. Um, but there's a relationship between acceleration and velocity.
and that says that acceleration as a function of time is equal to um, the time derivative of the velocity as a function of time. I'll just write it as v dot. And that also means that the velocity is equal to the integral of the acceleration with respect to time. And then, um, just like this translational relationship, um, there's an angular acceleration, and it relates to the angular. Uh, the angular acceleration is the Greek letter alpha, like a Jesus fish. Uh, angular, it relates to the angular velocity. Omega this way, um, alpha as a function of time is equal. What do you think this is going to say? Cosine of time? Yeah. <laughs> alpha, who thinks it's going to say alpha of time is equal to e to the power of t times cosine of t? That would be super weird. No, I'm just I'm just trying to bring out the you know the correlation here. So just like regular acceleration is the time derivative of velocity, angular acceleration is the time derivative of angular velocity. Okay. And then uh, fundamental theorem of calculus says angular velocity is the integral of alpha. Okay, so those those two things, the relationships between velocities and accelerations are the way calculus is going to come up more than half the time in the class. All right, so now... Uh, we haven't defined these quantities, velocity and acceleration, angular velocity, angular acceleration. So now we're going to actually, we're getting into physics right now. And we're going to start, the first uh, topic is kinematics of particles along a line. Um, you know what a line is, right? So uh, the only things we have left to define are kinematics and particles. So here's kinematics. Kinematics is describing motion without um, talking about the causes of the motion. So, for example, uh, if a, you know, like in a baseball game, if a baseball flies 400 feet or something, we'll be talking about tracking the motion of the ball without trying to figure out how the, the contact between the bat and the ball caused that. Okay. Um, when we get to that, it'll be called kinetics. Sounds very similar to this. I don't know. That seems really stupid to have these two things sound so similar, but that's just how it is. Um, another way to think about kinematics is kinematics uh, gives you relationships between quantities that could be measured off of a video. Uh, 
Um, so if you had markers all over a room and you took a video of things moving around, you could measure um, directions and speeds and accelerations and positions. You couldn't measure how hard the object ran into the wall or ran into other objects, and you couldn't measure the masses of the objects. Okay, and so um, kinematics isn't going to include any forces or masses. And then the second definition we need is particles. Um, and a particle is an object, objects with no length dimensions. So um, if you're treating something as a particle, you're acting like all of that object is located at a single point, okay? Um, and if an object has no length dimensions, you can't make any a distinction between the top and the bottom, the left and the right, okay? It's all just one thing. Uh, and so this leads to um, no ability to measure orientations of an object, okay? So if you're treating something as a particle, you can't tell well, like I said, you can't tell what's left and what's right up and down. You can't tell which direction its eyes are looking, okay? You can tell which direction it's moving, but you can't tell whether it's upside down or right side up, okay? Uh, so how many, how many, what percentage of physical objects in the world would you guess are actually particles? Zero. You know, but so this is a this is an approximation that we'll use when we don't care about an object's orientation. Okay. Um, and so, uh, in kinematics of particles, we'll measure motion according to one, two, three, four quantities. Position, velocity, and acceleration. Um, so now I'm going to go into, you know, careful definitions of all of those things. Uh, we'll start with position. Um, okay, so talking about position, what we're doing is we're, um, we're coming up with a uh, correspondence between something that happens in the actual world 
and a numerical system that lives in the mathematical world. Okay, so to talk about position, we have to talk about how to link those two things up. Okay. Um, so, at a given material position, uh, sorry, let me change this to location. What does it take to assign um, a numerical position value um, well it takes two things uh, You have to choose a zero position. That is, you have to um, you have to choose a physical place in the actual physical world that you're going to that you're going to say this is zero. Okay. Um, so I'll say it's a physical location that corresponds to zero position. Um, in a real physical way, what this means is you're choosing where to, so like what's the position of this pen, you know? Like give me a number for where that pen is. You can't do that until, like you can imagine using a ruler in some way to come up with a numerical value, but you can't do it until you choose where to set the ruler, where the zero on the ruler sits. You know what I mean? And so if we set the ruler, oh, well, there's no ruler. But if, we, if we set the ruler with its end here, then the location of this pen is, you know, a few inches different. Uh, well, if it's still there and we set the ruler over against the wall, then it's a few meters in the opposite direction, okay? So the first thing you have to do is choose a physical place that's called zero position. And then the second thing you have to choose is a positive direction. Um, if you still think of that ruler analogy, that's just choosing which direction the ruler is sitting. And we're going to imagine a ruler that has a positive direction and a negative direction. Um, so that's just direction in the physical world world that corresponds to positive. Okay, so let's think of um, an actual object sitting here. In order to come up with a numerical position for this object, you set a ruler down that has, you know, a zero somewhere. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, so on. And then we're imagining a ruler that not only has a positive direction, but um, goes in the negative direction too. One, two, three, four. There's negative five. Um, so let's say that the center of the ball, the thing we're treating as the location of the ball, um, falls right there. Then, according to this ruler placement, um,
this zero in positive direction. Uh, the ball's location is P position equals positive nine, if these are centimeters, you know, positive nine centimeters. Now that ball itself doesn't, isn't affected by where you put that ruler, you know. So that ball would be sitting on that spot of the floor no matter what. But we could get different numerical values for position by just moving that ruler around, flipping positive direction the other way, you know, flip the ruler over. And so every position value is just dependent on how you choose that zero position in that positive direction. Okay. Um, standard international units um, SI units uh, for position our meters uh, will abbreviate that as a lowercase m so if you wanted to put this position in um, in SI units, that would be 0 0.09 meters would be the location there. So in the example above, uh, the position is equal to 7.5 centimeters. I think you guys already took chemistry, right? So you've done these unit conversions and stuff. Um, so 7.5 centimeters, um, 100 centimeters is one meter. Centimeters cancel. Uh, it's not 7.5. That's in my example on my page. Uh, nine centimeters. Uh, so you get 0 0.09 meters. Are not good with that unit conversion or any questions on that? We'll, we'll do more. Um, um, now we also, we're going to want to, uh, what we want to know is the position as a function of time. We want to know not just where an object is, but how long it takes to get from here to there. Um, we need to specify two more things. Uh, no, just one more thing. Um, we have to choose a physical instant that corresponds to zero time. Basically, we have to choose the instant that we're turning on this imaginary stopwatch, you know. Um, so... We have to choose a instant then we're going to turn on the stopwatch um si units for time or seconds yep Abbreviate that lowercase s. Um, and uh, 
once we've made these three choices, we can observe motion observe a motion and represent it on a position versus time graph. Okay, we can't do that until we make these three choices, but these are the three things that let us connect the physical world to the mathematical world. Okay, so um, let me show an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, so let's say that this is the this is Lake Minnetonka, um, where you make a living hunting for uh, shells. And this is you. Gender may vary. I, I've become sensitive recently that most of my drawings seem to be males, but um, it's just because they're easier to draw. They wear easier bathing suits to draw. They don't have long hair. So you, <laughs> you could also think of it as a very uh, libertarian bald woman. Um, go away. Um, okay, and then this is like a buoy. And let's say the distance between this woman and, uh, this raft, it's not drawn to scale. Let's say this is 50 meters. And let's say from the raft to the buoy is 25 meters. And uh, let's say the swimmer um, takes uh, two minutes to get from the shore to the raft. Um, and then takes another one minute. to get from the raft to the buoy and then takes two minutes to get back to the raft and that's the whole journey hangs out at the raft after that And we're going to plot a position versus time graph um, in, for two cases. Uh, first, we're going to do it with um, time equals zero. Uh, like we're turning on the stopwatch when the swimmer leaves the shore. Um, our position equals zero. We're going to choose at the shore. 
and our positive direction, we're going to choose toward the center of the lake. And then we're going to do it again. with time equals zero being one minute before the swimmer leaves the shore. Uh, position equals zero is at the raft. And the positive direction is toward the shore, you know, pointing the opposite direction. And we'll see how these choices change the values that we see. Okay, so I think the easiest way to do this is we'll just make a little diagram of what the motion looks like. And then after that, based on our choices of these zeros in this positive direction, uh, we're going to assign numerical values to the stops along that path. Okay, so for A, the motion doesn't change. Uh, so I can draw this motion without any concern for what our choices are. Um, it goes out past the raft. To the buoy and then back to the raft. Uh, between this and this, we know that there's 50 meters. Between this and this, we know that there's 25 meters. And between this and this, we know that uh, two minutes elapsed pretty slow swimmer. That just occurred to me. I don't know. We don't know what the swimmer does in the middle. They might be hunting for shells. They got to make a living somehow. <laughs> uh, and then this is one minute. And then this is two minutes. Okay, so now let's label all these things. Um, I guess I'll do uh positions in red and times in green that's a little hard to see can you all see that mm -hmm. um okay so for part a we are uh saying that, well, let's do the times first, okay? Um, time equals zero is when the swimmer leaves the shore. So at this point in the motion, uh, in the path, time is equal to zero, right? Then two minutes go by, so what's the time at this point in the motion? Yeah, we'll just do it in minutes for now. Time equals two minutes. Uh, then one minute goes by from that until you get to the buoy. So what's the time there? Three. Three. And then two minutes go by from here to here. So what's the time here? Right. <laughs> and then um, for the positions, the zero position is on the shore. Positive direction is out towards the water. So what's the numerical position for, uh, associated with shore. Yeah, this is P equals zero. What's the position associated with this point in the raft? Yeah, P equals 50 meters. The buoy. And what about this final point? That's back at 50 again, yep. And so now we can say, um, Thank <laughs> you.
there's position, there's time. Um, there's 25 meters, 50 meters, um, two minutes, three minutes, five minutes. These are all in minutes. And so the motion goes from here to, oh no, I did, I put these in the wrong place. Uh, so we have a 50 and a 75. So there, to there, to there, to there. And we don't know what this motion looks like in between, but everything that happens in this class is going to be smooth. It's going to be differentiable because um, we're going to go from this position graph to velocities and accelerations by taking derivatives. And so you can't have any jagged things and take derivatives. So that's what a position versus time graph looks like for that first set of choices. OK, so now second set of choices. Um, so what I would like you to do is find markers and choose groups. Um, and uh, I would say choose a group with people you hate because uh, that tension, I think, makes you better scientists. OK? And uh, find a board and do this for part B. So. Um, in this case, I'll just go through this sort of quick. Um, the motion doesn't change, right? The, the swimmer still starts at the shore, passes the raft, gets to the buoy, turns around and goes back to the raft. Um, this time, that starting point is time equals one. Uh, gets to the raft at Um, gets to the raft at time equals three, gets to the buoy at time equals five, and then gets back to the raft at time equals seven. No, what did I do wrong? Oh, this this should be four. And this should be six. And this time, uh, our position equals zero is at the raft. And the positive direction is this way. So if it's 50 meters between here and here, and that's 50 meters in the positive direction, then we know the shore has the numeric value positive 50. And if it's 25 meters from the zero to the buoy in the negative direction, then we know the buoy has the numeric value negative 25. And so when you plot this, uh, we have a positive 50, a negative 25, one, uh, three, four, six, and it starts here. Nope. Starts here, and then gets to the um, the next place it gets is to the raft at three seconds, three minutes. Then it gets to the buoy at four minutes, and then it gets back to the raft here. Um, and there are three changes that happened to these graphs. Uh, there was a horizontal shift.
um, that came from choosing the time equals zero instant. So t equals zero choice, let's say. There was a vertical shift. that came from the choice of position equals zero. And then there was a um, vertical flip, flip about a vertical axis that came from the positive direction choice. Um, one thing you should notice about this, um, like what if instead of saying time equals zero was a minute before the swimmer started, what if I said time equals zero was when the swimmer reached the raft? You know, um, mathematically that makes perfect sense. You could say that the swimmer uh, left the shore at time equals minus two minutes, right? That makes, but uh, nobody in physics uses negative times, so we're not going to, okay? Um, there's no reason for that, but we're just not going to. So um, never use negative times. Um, so that example that we just did was based on like some finite, you know, we said the object was here at one instant, here at another instant. Instead of doing that in this class, uh, we're going to, um, we're going to have positions represented as smooth functions of time. Um, so we'll, I'll say almost always. have uh, position given as a smooth function of time. Um, so that's like, yeah, what's up, what's up? I'm a function of time. <laughs> <laughs> that was stupid. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, so like, for example, um, we'll be given, you know, position as a function of time is equal to 2t cubed minus, uh, minus 20. And based on that, you know, you know all the, the information at the finite instance, you know, that tells us that um, at time equals one, uh, the position is equal to minus 18. At time equals zero, position is equal to minus 20, so on. Uh, one other thing to notice is, um, so in every kind of problem, you know, the idea with that swimmer example was that you can't do physics until you've made those three choices, you know, the zero position. The, um, but if a problem starts with you being given position as a function of time, it means that those three choices have already been made. So uh, notice, if you're given position as a function of time, it means those choices of p equals zero, positive direction, and time equals zero, 
have already been chosen. Any questions about, so that's about it for position. Any questions about that? So now instantaneous velocity. Um, so the velocity is a function of time is equal to the derivative of the position is a function of time, which is p dot. The SI units for velocity um, uh, are meters per second. And so that's abbreviated lowercase m over lowercase s. Um, and one way you can think of velocity, so you can think of velocity as a magnitude and that magnitude of the velocity is the object's speed and b a sign and the sign of the velocity tells you the direction of motion Okay, so if an object um, has a velocity of negative 50 meters per second, it means its speed is 50 meters per second and it's moving in the negative direction. Uh, so like uh, from, let's go back to this example. I'll draw it up here. So let's go back to the swimmer example. And let's do the one where, um, so there's the motion. And let's say this is the position equals zero this is the positive direction. Let's call this A, B, C. Okay, so um, when the swimmer is going on the path from A to C, what's gonna be the sign of the velocity? Mm -hmm. What? The sign of the velocity? Yeah, positive, positive that's right. Um, because the swimmer is you know, moving in the direction of what we chose is positive. And then when the swimmer is going from C back to B, the swimmer is going opposite our positive direction. So the sign is going to be negative. So um, from A to C, the velocity is going to be positive. From C back to B, the velocity is going to be negative. Um, so let's do an example. Uh, let's say that we have 
position versus time. Uh, position is a function of time that's equal to negative 5t squared plus 5. Um, if you plot this graph, It is a parabola like that. Keeps going. Um, so that's position, that's time. Uh, and this is at time equals one. Um, so let's think about this point at time equals 0. 0.5. So based on a position versus time graph, We won't calculate the velocity yet, but based on the position versus time graph, what direction is the object moving? At time equals five seconds. Okay, so how would you figure that out? Anyone have an idea? So easiest way is we know the, um, the velocity, we can come up with the velocity as a function of time by just taking the derivative of the position as a function of time. So plug that value in, we'll get a, we'll get a number. And um, that number is either gonna be positive or negative and, uh, and that'll tell us the direction. But, how, but looking at it graphically, how could you figure out the direction it's moving? Like on a position, you know, on a graph like this, physically, what does the, or graphically, what does the derivative tell you? What direction the velocity is in? Yeah, it tells you the, just in general, what a derivative does is tell you the slope of the tangent line. So if we draw the tangent line here, velocity is the slope of this tangent. And is the slope of that tangent line positive or negative? Negative. Right. So the slope of the tangent is negative. So at that instant, at time equals 0.5, the object is moving in the negative direction. Okay, so now let's, uh, can also do it by taking the derivative. So the velocity is the time derivative of the position function. If you take the derivative of this function with respect to time, you get negative 10t. So the velocity at 0.5 is negative 10 times 0.5 negative five. So, you know, you can also see it that way. Um, it's moving in the negative direction. Uh, 
um, what's the speed of this object at time equals half a second? Five. Five, right. So this velocity you can always think of as a combination of those two things, a direction that is given by the sign and a speed that's given by the magnitude. Any questions about velocity? Right, so let's talk about instantaneous acceleration. Um, the acceleration as a function of time is equal to the time derivative of the velocity. And since the velocity is the time derivative of the position, acceleration is also the second time derivative of the position. Um, For motion along a line, um, non-zero acceleration just means an object is speeding up or slowing down. The velocity is changing. We'll see that uh, when we get to 2D and 3D motion, um, you can have non-zero acceleration without the speed changing because um, any time an object is turning, it's accelerating. That's why if you're on like a tilt-a-whirl or like a spinning type ride, like that funny feeling is, is from the acceleration. And the thing isn't changing speeds, it's just... Uh, it's just changing direction really fast, and that's producing this big acceleration. But for motion along a line, there's no such thing as changing or as turning. And so non-zero acceleration just means changing speed. Um, so whether it's speeding up or slowing down, um, you might think, I think, you know, if, if you had to guess, most people would say, an object must be speeding up if the acceleration is positive and slowing down if the acceleration is negative. But that's not how it works. Um, so how does sign of the acceleration tell you whether an object is speeding up or slowing down? Well, it has to do with the sign of the acceleration and also the sign of the velocity. So if the acceleration and the velocity have the same sign, then the object is speeding up. On the other hand, if the acceleration 
and the velocity have opposite signs, the object's slowing down. Um, okay, so let's, let me just draw a position versus time graph and we'll think about, um, okay, so let's say that's a position versus time graph. And I'm going to break it up into uh, pieces. Let's call this point A, B, C, D, E. First, uh, over what interval? Is the object moving in the positive direction for intervals? Okay. So how do we know when when it's moving in the positive direction? from a position versus time graph. Well, what's the relationship between, so moving in the positive direction is determined by, by velocity, right? So we're looking for when the velocity is positive and when it's negative. And on a position versus time graph, how can you tell the instantaneous velocity? Okay. Yeah, it's the slope of the tangent lines. So you're looking for all the places where the tangent lines have positive slope. So in, in this case, that's just a single interval. Um, what's the interval where the tangent lines have positive slopes? A to C. A to C. Yep. On A to C, the tangents have positive slopes. Uh, second, uh, when's it moving in the negative direction? E. Yep. Um, when is the acceleration positive? Okay, so this is not asking when's it speeding up or slowing down. This is just asking numerically when, um, and, and remember that acceleration is the second time derivative of position. So you're basically looking at this and trying to figure out when the second derivative is positive. Can you remember when that would be? There are two separate intervals. A to B and D to E. Yep. So anytime it's concave up, the position versus time graph is concave up. Um, the uh, the acceleration is positive. You can also think of it as um, intervals where the, where the, tangent, the slopes of the tangent lines are getting more positive. You know, like here, it starts out like it's not very positive, more positive, more positive, more positive. So that's a positive acceleration. Same thing over here. It's negative, less negative, less negative, less negative. 
So it's getting more positive over that whole interval. Um, so acceleration is positive uh, from A to B and D to E. Because it's concave up. Uh, when is the acceleration negative? From B to D. Um, because it's concave down over that interval. Uh, then E when is the object speeding up. Um, from A to B? Yes. C to B? Yes. Very good. Um, so there's two ways to think about that. Um, One is that the slopes of the tangent lines are getting farther from horizontal. Horizontal is, is zero velocity. So one, the tangent slopes, uh, I should say, I don't know, I'm getting more vertical. And the second way to think about it is you're looking for places where the velocity and the acceleration have uh, the same sign. So if you look at this, um, what's the What's the velocity over this interval? What's the sign of the velocity? Positive. Positive. What's the sign of the acceleration? Positive. Positive, because it's concave up. So those have the same sign, so this is speeding up. What's the sign of the velocity from B to C? Positive. Positive. What's the sign of the acceleration? Negative. Negative, so it's slowing down there. Uh, C to D, what's the sign of the velocity? Negative. Uh, negative. Acceleration? Negative. Negative, so it's speeding up. And then velocity? Negative. Acceleration? Positive. Positive, so it's slowing down. So A to B and uh, C to D. And then for F, you know, we, we just went through that, but um, slowing down, I uh, use the same reasoning. And it gives you B to C and uh, D to E. Okay, so one more thing on the board. Uh, on the board, uh, draw three position versus time graphs.
one where the position function is equal to zero, two where the velocity function is equal to zero, and three where the acceleration function is equal to zero. Okay, good. Same group. Okay, so here's what it is. Uh, for position, the position function to be equal to zero, um, it has to be along the x-axis because uh, the position has to be zero at every point. Velocity, the velocity function equal to zero has to be horizontal. because the slope of the tangent has to be zero, but it can be anywhere shifted along the line. And then the acceleration function to be equal to zero, um, the slopes of the tangents can't be changing, so it has to be a line with any slope and any, you know, shifted anywhere, any shift. Um, so if you have a non-zero acceleration, uh, you know, uh, position versus time graph with a non-zero acceleration has some kind of concavity. It has some kind of uh, curve to it. Anywhere you have a straight line, you know the acceleration is equal to zero. Uh, any questions about any any of the stuff we went over today? Um, so tomorrow we're going to do a lab, so it won't be connected to this stuff. Um, and then on Tuesday, uh, I'll go back into some examples, and we'll just get more practice with this. Um, Tuesday, right? That's the next time I'll see you after lab. Um, so I think what I'm going to do with assignments, what? Oh, yeah, you're right. I won't see you Tuesday. I'll see you Thursday. Okay. Thank you. We, normally, the average, the usual week, you'll have class with me Tuesday and Thursday and then lab with me on Friday. Yeah. But next week is abnormal. Right. Yeah, so, and I think what I'm going to do is just give assignments on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, and so, you know, you don't have to turn anything in tomorrow in lab. You can just turn it in on Tuesday. Okay, but that'll be on D2L. Anyone know, are you on D2L yet or still not? I, I don't think we are. Okay. Okay, so I guess Meredith's just going to um, email you the assignments and stuff. Until then. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, thanks. See you tomorrow.